Welcome to the HKS Energy Policy Seminar. I'm Joe Aldi, I'll serve as the host today. Welcome back from Thanksgiving. Thrilled to have a full room in here and to have many colleagues and friends joining us online in our hybrid format. Uh, before we turn to today's speaker, I'd like to make an announcement about the seminar series. We are adding one more seminar for this coming Monday, December 5th. As some of you know, uh, the so-called Russian oil price cap will be implemented starting that day. And we're excited to have, as our visiting professor, Catherine Wolfram joining us, as well as Ben Harris, who's the Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at the Department of the Treasury, flying up to join us for a discussion about the Russian oil price cap. So we'll meet again in here at noon on Monday, December 5th. For students, an opportunity for a free lunch and a break from studying for your finals. For everyone else, we hope it's an opportunity for you to learn more about this important policy issue. You'll be able to register online for those of you on Zoom uh, to join us virtually as well. So look out for that on the seminar website in our normal social media uh, advertising. But let me now turn to today's conversation. We're thrilled to have with us Rich Glick, Chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in the world of acronyms known as FERC, here to speak on how climate change awakened a sleepy little agency. Now, Chairman Glick has served as a commissioner of FERC since 2017 and as chairman since January 21st, 2021. Before joining the commission, he was general counsel for the Democrats on the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, serving as a senior policy advisor on numerous issues, including electricity and renewable energy, issues that I think we'll hear a lot about today in his remarks. Chairman Glick also has extensive experience in the private sector, having served as vice president of government affairs for Iberdola's renewable energy, electric and gas utility, and natural gas storage businesses in the United States. Glick previously served as the director of government affairs for PPM Energy, and before that was a director of government affairs for Pacificor. Chairman Glick also has experience in the federal government, having served as a senior policy advisor to the Secretary of Energy during the Clinton administration. It's our pleasure to welcome you, Chairman Glick, to the Energy Policy Seminar. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, listening to that, I realize how old I am, listening to all my, my biography there. But um, I want to first thank Professor Aldi for uh, inviting me uh, to appear today. Um, I've known him, I think, going back to the um, Obama administration when he was, I think most of you, if not all of you, know that he was. Uh, with the Obama administration the first couple of years. And um, I was working for Iberdrola, which at, uh, was a big uh, wind and solar uh, uh, energy de project developer. And you might recall at the beginning, late 2007 and 2008, and even early 2009, a lot of economic concerns in large part um, from a renewable energy perspective, um, the companies uh, that were developing these projects used to monetize these tax credits. And essentially, a little more complicated than this, but we sold off the tax credits um, to, to big entities that had a lot of tax appetite, um, big banks, insurance companies, so on. And they all lost all their tax appetite overnight. And all of a sudden, you have all these companies that want to build these projects and the inability to use the tax credit, which caused these projects to be uneconomic. Well, we went to the, um, the first the Obama transition team and then to the Obama administration when, after the inauguration. And Professor Aldi was extremely helpful. And I've always been very grateful because what he, he ended up coming up with a, a, an alternative solution, essentially allowing companies to essentially get um, cash payments in lieu of the tax credits. And that led to billions, and I'm talking about tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars of investment in the US. Um, and uh, it's, it, we are talking about job saved to save my job, for sure. But um, <laughs> I want to thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Aldi. Um, and, but that also is a good example of public policy that's not just theoretical, public policy can have a huge impact on individuals, on the economy as a whole, and 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 it's that's that's why you all are here studying at the Kennedy School. It's 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 a well worth a well important profession. Um, I'm going to talk obviously about FERC today and, and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And as Professor Aldi mentioned, you know it, it, FERC used to be known as a sleepy little agency. Um, there wasn't a lot of attention paid. You know there, there were of course companies that were regulated by FERC. Um, and uh, certainly um, uh, some, some uh, industry types that were very much affected by the commission's actions and, and paid a lot of attention. But outside of that, no one really thought much about FERC. You, you used to say, oh, I'm going over to FERC to people would like, you know, make a joke about the, the four letter word or something, or, or just in general say, what, what's that all about? 
but that's changed very dramatically um, in large part due to climate change. Um, and, and I'm gonna, gonna talk about that a little bit in a second, but I, I, you know, I, I think that, 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 that all of a sudden you have um, uh, people paying attention to the commission, whether it be from the media, whether it be in government, um, certainly I'm all too aware, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, members of Congress are much more focused on FERC than they used to be. Um, but also uh, just, uh, just again, members of the public paying attention a little bit more to what we're doing. And, and I'd say because, because of what we're doing, maybe in some ways has been highlighted more, I think it, it, the fact is, is that the people are, uh, the, 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 the debates at, at FERC, which used to be very genteel for the most part, there, I'm not gonna say there weren't times, as I understand in the history of FERC, where there were disagreements or major issues and disagreements among commissioners. But for the most part, commissioners worked out their um, concerns behind the scenes and the, uh, the commission, it was, it was a very collegial body. Um, that's not necessarily the same case anymore. And, and again, part of that is the issues that we, we are dealing with, which have incredibly high stakes. Um, uh, we, you know, we talk about climate change, but we talk about what that means for the ener energy industry, whether that means electric utilities for people that build power plants, for um, uh, natural gas pipelines, for oil pipelines, for hydroelectric facilities, everything. Um, it, it, the, 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 the focus, and I think the focus might be your interest is, and I see this interest in, in, in schools around the country now, is people are much more focused on energy than ever before because of the impact it's having not only on our economy, but also the impact it's having on the environment, the impact it's having on the future of this planet. I mean, I don't want to be too dramatic about it, but I think it's as serious as that. And um, because of that, again, we're no, we're no longer that sleepy little agency. Um, I would say, uh, just to start off with a little bit background about FERC, I think in terms of energy regulation here in the United States, there's really two forms for the most part. There's the state level and the states, uh, the state utility commissions and so on regulate a lot of different uh, uh, intrastate activities related to energy. And then there's the federal level, which is primarily interstate um, energy issues. There's some that may be more interstate than others, but for the most part, FERC has authority with regard to those interstate issues. And we have, there's a five, it's a five member commission at FERC. Um, and it's it, by law, it's supposed to be three members of one party and two members of the other. You could have an independent and it's happened in the past, but for the most part, uh, three generally of the president's party and two of the, the party that's not in the White House at the time. So right now we have three Democrats and two Republicans, but it's, it's, it's supposed to be an independent agency, meaning that um, we, uh, the president can't, uh, he can fire, his cabinet secretaries, other people, other political appointees and other agencies, he can't fire for commissioners. So once we get nominated and, and, and hopefully confirmed by Congress and sworn in, we're essentially on our own, which is, which is I think mostly a good thing, right? We're, not, we're trying to take politics as much as possible out of the actions that we, that we take. Now that doesn't always, that's not always the case. Sometimes there's a situation we have three Democrats voting one way and two Republicans voting another way, but it's not all, it's, it's, it's we try to, um, uh, limit that as much as possible. And as a matter of fact, um, we have, I, I think there's been 99% of the orders since I've been the chair that at least one Republican has voted with the Democrats. That doesn't always happen, but it, 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 it does. I think there's been 17 cases where there've been partisan votes out of 1800 orders. So so really not, not that many that orders when you think about it, not that many partisan situations when you think about it. Um, in terms of what we do, and to, to be a little more specific when I say interstate, um, we have a variety of responsibilities. Um, uh, we regulate, for instance, um, uh, wholesale energy markets. So for sales for resale. So if you have a power plant generating power, selling to the utility, which eventually sells to you and your, your home or your business, um, that's the, the first sale is, 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 is an interstate uh, wholesale sale. And that's, that's we, we, we regulate that. We regulate the rates associated with that, the terms and conditions associated with that transaction. Um, we also regulate uh, the electric, uh, uh, much of the ele electric transmission system, at least the interstate uh, transmission system. Um, especially the high voltage lines around the country. And, and we, we, we essentially regulate the rates charged for transmission service, but also um, a number of other issues associated with transmission planning and transmission development and so on. We were, were very involved in that. Although I wanna highlight that we don't have jurisdiction over the siting of these transmission lines. That's actually, we, we have limited authority there, but for the most part, that's subject to, for, to, to the states. The states have jurisdiction over that. Uh, with regard to natural gas and oil, um, we don't actually have jurisdiction to regulate the rates 
for uh, that for sales of oil, most sales of oil, most sales of natural gas. Um, uh, Congress essentially revised that or eliminated that back in the 1970s. But we do regulate the transportation of natural gas, interstate natural gas and interstate um, oil and other liquid fuels via pipeline. So we, again, we have to make sure the rates are just reasonable and, and, and so on, but uh, and we, we oversee the terms of the, that, that, that responsibility as well. Um, so, but we, we regulate again, the, the transactions associated with the pipelines, but not the actual sale of natural gas. So if you think your natural gas bill is high this winter, don't blame us. Um, it actually is something we can talk about it later on if you want, but that's something I actually think Congress needs to address because we have these situations sometimes where very cold weather where you see price spikes and no one has any authority to do anything about it in the United States, even state regulators. Um, but with but what's different from electric transmission versus uh, uh, fuels that are transported by pipeline is that we actually also have, at least on the natural gas side, we also have the authority to site um, interstate natural gas pipelines. So for instance, states don't have that authority. So if FERC approves a pipeline, the state for the most part can't, can't get in the way of that. Um, that's a controversial um, area, but that's something that Congress gave the commission authority over. We also cite actually and license hydroelectric facilities, at least major hydroelectric facilities that aren't federally owned around the country. So we do have significant, even though we're considered an economic agency, we spend quite a bit of time citing infrastructure. And then we also just quickly mentioned the uh, Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act, which was, enact, in, which was enacted in 1978, I believe, in order to promote uh, small clean energy facilities as well as cogeneration facilities. And we, we administer that as well. So we have very broad authority, although again, we share it with the states. The states have authority again over retail electric sales and retail natural, uh, uh, retail natural gas sales, but not wholesale. And uh, we, we kind of sometimes do a dance with the states in terms of where, where our authority, where, the, where you draw the line between where our authority is and where the state's authority, authority lies as well. Um, but within that, uh, within that, um, that structure, I, you know, I, 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 it, 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 like I said before, the fact that climate change has become an, an ever more imposing issue, I think a lot of the, 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 the work that we do, I think really has, you can, see, you can see it from a climate change perspective. So for instance, I mentioned the regulation of, of electric uh, rates. Uh, we regulate markets. A lot of our markets that we rely on are competitive markets. They're really market constructs. But the point, point being is that we oversee how those, those market constructs work. And many of the decisions made in, those, in, in terms of how, how those markets are organized and designed and so on can have a dramatic impact on whether um, uh, older, um, less efficient electric generation facilities, in many cases fossil fuel facilities, uh, can remain operating versus newer, cleaner facilities, maybe renewable energy facilities. There's a lot of uh, market issues associated with that. So for instance, um, um, and I'll get into a, an example in a second uh, as, as to how you design, how, you, how a market design issue can, can have a dramatic impact on clean energy. But I would also say that um, we also have a responsibility to make sure these markets are organized in a way that don't discriminate against certain technologies. So for instance, we issued a, 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 a rule several years ago uh, telling at least the, organized, the, 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 the entities that operate organized markets around the United States that they, they can't discriminate against, so, uh, against energy storage. B battery storage operates in a way that a lot of these markets were designed in a manner that no one really thought much about battery storage. Or for that matter, a lot of times they didn't think about solar or wind when these energy market design issues were decided 20, 30, 40 years ago. So what, what, one of the things we do is we say, you, have to go, you, can, you can't discriminate against these technologies. You have to facilitate their participation in, in, in these wholesale markets around the country. And that's uh, being, that, that particular rule is being implemented right now. And again, on electric transmission, pretty significant role to play with regard to, um, uh, the, from a climate change perspective, is a lot of people focus on the need to build out transmission for a variety of reasons, in large part to access the, 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 the great wind and the great solar resources we have around the country. We have great, probably the best resources in the United States uh, for renewable resources, you know, solar and wind primarily around the, around the world. We have the best resources, but in most cases, they're located very far away from where people live and people consume energy. And so you have to build out tra the transmission grid to access those clean energy uh, resources. Then with regard to um, our authority over siting natural gas pipelines, um, for instance, there's a big issue there from a climate change perspective of, of um, how, do you, uh, how do you deal with the fact that, um, uh, that those, those facilities, whether when they're being constructed or when they're operating or when maybe the gas is burned downstream, how do you deal with the climate, the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions associated with those projects? Do you take those emissions into account? And I'll get more into that in a second, but that's a, 
that's a significant um, dispute that's, that's pending before FERC about how you consider the climate change impacts of, um, of the, the, the infra infrastructure that we cite. And there's a whole variety of other, other um, uh, authorities that we have, um, uh, again, that, that I think, you know, climate change has just become a big issue. And I, you know, when I first came to FERC, this is 2017 now, I didn't think it was going to be like the way it the way it's become in terms of more controversial issues, and again, the way climate change played a role. But um, everyone that I noticed the first like six or seven months that um, uh, that the, that I was at FERC, people would come in to talk to us. You know, your various groups, um, consumer groups, um, state regulators, uh, utilities, uh, pipeline developers. Everyone would come in, and, and, and almost undoubtedly, climate change would be a big part of our discussion. What they're doing to address climate change, what what, what what each company, a lot of companies have, have these goals now, but in terms of greenhouse gas emissions reductions, but how how FERC's, the, 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 the markets that we oversee, how those markets should be structured to accommodate, facilitate um, uh, uh, efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Or in some cases, people would say, that's not your role. I mean, FERC is, has traditionally been considered to be, an, 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 a, a, we don't, we don't, we're not a, an environmental regulator. That's for EPA, that's for the states, that's for, um, other federal agencies as well, um, but it just it, it became, in my opinion, just in everything that we did. It's such an important issue that I ended up speaking to someone who was an advisor at the time, was now our general counsel, his name is Matt Christensen, and we decided to put together all the. He wrote ninety nine percent of it, but a, a law review article uh, called a very catchy title of FERC and climate change. But but the the, the point being is that uh, yeah, the, it, it, it wasn't wasn't really didn't really draw people to the. But the point being is is really kind of laying out in, in some detail. The issues that are facing for kind of going on a, on a going forward basis, and and how that uh, can have a dramatic impact on, on on the way we the way we regulate the way the way the debates have, have come up at the commission. And I wanted to kind of, if it's okay, I wanted to focus on three kind of give you three examples um, uh, of where I think climate change has played an enormous role in what we do. And the first has to do with state subsidies. So um, as an increasing number of uh, states and utilities and others wanted to uh, move forward with a, green, a greener approach to, to, to uh, uh, generating electricity. Um, a lot of states enacted subsidies, whether it be for, for nuclear power. Uh, in many cases, those subsidies were aimed at keeping older nuclear plants online, not allowing them to retire prematurely, but also a lot of it focusing on incentives to develop more uh, renewable energy. And you know, as those subsidies grew over time and as, as it was having a, a more significant impact. And you could see this the impact around the country in terms of the amount of uh, clean energy generation that was uh, participating in these markets. Uh, some of the more traditional um, uh, generators fought back, uh, arguing that, that it's unfair to allow subsidized uh, generation to participate in the market where it's supposed to have a level playing field. Now we'll get to the level playing field argument in a second. But what they 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 promoted these ideas called minimum offer price rules, which were already in existence to deal with market power. But the, the minimum offer price rule, and I, and I know I'm getting pretty weedy here, and I apologize for that. But really, it was aimed at saying, for for renewable for facilities that, that were subsidized, you could not bid in into a market. Into they used to have these auctions, like for for generating capacity, for instance. You couldn't bid into the market at the price you wanted to bid in at. You had to bid in at a higher price. Based on what the what the what the so-called market monitor is telling you, you can bid in at to essentially account for this discrepancy between subsidized generation and unsubsidized generation. Well, uh, it had several impacts. Um, one of which it it, it it raised prices because consumers all of a sudden have to pay higher prices now because the the more efficient the clean the cleaner in this case less less expensive generation couldn't bid in at the price that it wanted to bid in at. And again, that raised market prices overall, but it also ignored, I think, a very important part is that that, that you, when 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 for years and years and years, energy has always been subsidized for going back to hundreds of years, probably or at least a hundred years here in the United States. But all these t other technologies, whether it be coal, natural gas, um, uh, nuclear, other technologies, they were all getting subsidies, and no one ever said, well, that's unfair that they can bid in at this price, but some new entrant can't 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 beat out that, that entrant because they the, the, the older um, facility because they can't compete against them because of the subsidy. But all of a sudden now they're, they're, everyone's claiming, oh, we got to do something about it. And unfortunately, from my perspective, the commission, the majority of commissioners at the time said, we need to impose these MOPERs. And in my opinion, 
A lot of this was done for two reasons. One of which was to raise prices, as I mentioned earlier. Like if electric generators were, were feeling they were being compensated enough, especially the, again, the, the more traditional, older, less efficient generation. But secondly, I really think it was, they were, they were ineffective. Some of those generators and those, their lobbyists were ineffective in getting the states to stop or to, or to, or to, or to not expand their subsidy programs for clean energy. And so they figured this was a way to essentially overturn that state legislation. I honestly, I've said it, I said it publicly a number of times, and I honestly believe that was the major focus of that effort. And uh, it was very hard fought out. Um, that some of those uh, uh, orders are still being litigated. The good news, again, from my perspective, I want some people have different views. My perspective is, fortunately, all three regions in which this, this, th these policies were adopted, which was New England here, New England, New York, and then PJM, which is uh, a big regional transmission organization that covers primarily a number of mid-Atlantic states and some Midwestern states. All three of them essentially rescinded their MOPE or minimum offer price rule uh, policies. Uh, and the commission accepted that. I think I can talk about all of them because I think they're no longer pending, pending before FERC anymore. They are being litigated. We'll see how, how all that goes. But again, I think that was where I think we saw, uh, at least in my time at FERC, really the, the first battleground of some of these you know, clean energy versus dirty energy. Now, the dirty energy, that's, that's not fair. That's not clean energy versus fossil energy um, uh, policies. And that was, um, uh, again, like I said, still being litigated. It ended up costing or could have cost consumers over a billion dollars uh, or actually billions of dollars overall. Fortunately, I think uh, given that the, these regions reversed it, I don't think it had much of a cost impact, at least in the short term, but it would have. Um, the second uh, example I wanted to point out was pipeline siting. And I, I mentioned a second ago that FERC has authority over siting of natural gas pipeline, interstate natural gas pipelines, but also LNG facilities, export and import facilities. And um, uh, just before I got to FERC in 2017, the, the courts, said, uh, the DC circuit said, FERC, you have to consider the, if it's reasonably foreseeable, and that's obviously in the eye of the beholder, but if it's reasonably foreseeable, FERC has to consider the greenhouse gas emissions associated with that um, proposed pipeline, if a new pipeline was gonna be built or a new LNG facility was gonna be built. And we'll take a pipeline and say, not only do you have to consider the greenhouse gas emissions associated with um, uh, the construction of the pipeline and the operation of the pipeline, but also when you send the gas downstream, let's say to a, to, to, a, to, a, to a electric generator, if you can reasonably foresee that that's gonna happen, the gas is obviously gonna get burned at the electric generator and there's gonna be greenhouse gas emissions associated with that. So the court said, FERC, when you consider whether a, a proposed pipeline is in the public interest, you essentially have to consider what the, the benefits are, which a lot of times are economic benefits or accessing, uh, allowing regions to access more gas, um, either for electric generation or for other, for heating or whatever it is. But you have to weigh that when you consider whether the project's in the public interest, you weigh that uh, against the, um, uh, the emissions associated, uh, I, should, I should say, the, I'm sorry, the adverse environmental impacts. And FERC has always been considering adverse impacts on wetlands, and on uh, other uh, air quality issues, on visibility, noise, things like that. But FERC never, and, 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 and went out of its way in some cases, uh, the commission has never uh, examined the greenhouse gas emissions impact. So the court said, you have to do this. And then several other courses, court cases uh, down the line, the court said, you have to do it. They kept on saying, you have to do it, you have to do it. But um, because of disputes about climate change and different, the different makeup of, the, of FERC at the time, uh, the commission did not, essentially has not, um, for the most part, listened to the courts on that. We have, there's been a couple of cases, uh, more, a couple orders more recently where we, we, we're looking at some greenhouse gas emissions, but for the most part, we haven't followed what the courts have told us. And that, that is being strictly, strongly debated even today. And the example I'll give you is, um, after I became chair, I worked with a couple of our colleagues and admittedly the Democratic colleagues on the commission to put together a policy statement saying, this is how we're gonna do it going forward because this is what the courts are telling us to do. And if we don't follow this, the courts are gonna do what they've been doing the last couple of years, sending these orders back to us to redo over and over again. We're not making any progress. We're, we're creating uncertainty for everybody. Um, so uh, we issued this policy statement and boom, like, like an hour later, I got a call from a United States Senator. I had to hold the phone out here because he was screaming so loudly. And um, there were, uh, and just uh, industry, everybody was just complaining vigorously. Now. It's true that in our policy statement, we probably could have been more clear on certain things. And so we pulled it back and it's now a draft policy statement and we've gotten a lot of comments for it. And it's my intention, and my hope at least I should say, is that the commission at some point issues this policy statement in the future to essentially analyze 
or provide a, a, for, a foundation for how we're going to analyze greenhouse gas emissions going forward. But the fact is, we still haven't um, issued that policy statement. There's strong differences of opinion. If you look at almost all of our orders related to pipelines and LNG facilities, both, and LNG facilities, you're talking about a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emissions just associated with the operation of the facilities. They're, they're, they're huge. They use a lot of energy. Um, the, 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 if, if we don't, at least in my opinion, if we don't provide some sort of foundation, as I said earlier, for how we're going to analyze greenhouse gas emissions, we're never going to have enough certainty for go on a going forward basis. That doesn't mean, and I want to make it clear, just because you find that there's greenhouse gas emissions, and even if you found those emissions are significant, there are a lot of things you can do, like mitigate. You can require mitigation. We, we, we mitigate the other issues I talked about, wetlands and visibility and, and, and sound and all those other issues. We, we, we mitigate that constantly. We can mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, but somehow people equate the overseeing or just considering the impact of greenhouse gas emissions is somehow the death knell for the natural gas pipeline industry and the natural and, and, and the LNG uh, LNG industry as well, and uh, the, that 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 particular experience is I think shaken, for in some ways the the, the response that we got and uh, uh, this I, I would say there's like I said earlier there's, there's quite a bit of disagreement among the commissioners even to this day as to how we should move forward or whether we should even move forward whether we should even consider greenhouse gas emissions at all in our analysis. Um, and the third example I want to talk about is, and that'll be the last one, and I'll talk a little bit more about FERC, but is from a reliability perspective, electricity reliability. And this is, this is a big issue for New England this winter. New England is heavily reliant on natural gas, um, but doesn't have access to uh, a lot of pipeline capacity. We talked about uh, pipelines. It doesn't have access to a lot of natural gas. They have, they, the region relies very heavily on importing uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas, from, from around the world. And the problem with that, of course, is that um, uh, it, it's okay under normal weather conditions, but if you have a, a cold spell that lasts for a long period of time, um, there are there's some real concerns about that, whether there'll be enough natural gas, because a lot of it's gonna be used for heating, of course, there will be enough natural gas available for electric generation. And if there's not, is there enough, is there gonna be enough electricity or are we gonna have to, are there gonna have to be rolling blackouts? Uh, so that, that's gonna be a big issue this winter uh, in New England, but it's, it's an issue you see increasingly around the country. And if you look at really the genesis of this, there's a lot of reasons for concerns about the reliability of the grid. A lot of it really is related to weather. Um, in California, I mean, the temperatures this past summer, 120, 114, 160. I mean, whoever heard of that? I mean, maybe in Death Valley they had some, but no, no, no other place in California did you have uh, that type of, type of weather. The drought, and it's not, and you wonder if it's a drought or if it's, it's a longstanding condition now, it was in Texas earlier this year, and they said, well, this is our 20th year of drought. At what time do you say, is it no longer a, a, a phenomenon of you know, just a drought? I mean, is it, is it, it's a constant situation. Drought is a big problem because obviously it reduces hydropower, electric generation capacity, but it also uh, limits the ability of, um, the, the availability of water to cool, for, to use for cooling for certain electric generation. And then even more important in the West, it leads to a lot of wildfires. And we're seeing wildfire season grow longer and more ferociously, and or at least the wildfires are more ferocious. And, 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 and that actually has an impact on grid reliability as well, because a lot of times either the fire itself will disrupt or take down a, a very important transmission line, or smoke itself can sometimes do that. And uh, so we, we've, all these things combined just in the West, you hear all the time that talk about reliability of the grid, especially in California, a lot of it's weather phenomenon. In, in other parts of the country, we had Texas a couple of years ago, winter storm Uri, um, now, Texas is not as connected to the rest of the grid as everyone else, but they had just unbelievably cold weather for long periods of time, at least for them. 200 people died because they didn't have electricity. They had rolling blackouts there in Texas. I mean, that's in, in the United States of America, 200 people died. And so you, you, all of a sudden, people are focused on grid reliability. You see stories in the newspapers, stories on the news. You turn them on, on some of these cable outlets. So you see it on a constant basis now. And it, it's something we take very seriously. I mean, we, have, we actually have authority um, over the, uh, to, to establish mandatory standards, reliability standards. And we take that responsibility very seriously, like I said. But, but the, the problem is, is that we're, we, we, we see this, the growing threat of weather. Obviously, uh, hot weather, cold weather increases demand for electricity as well. And at the same time, and it's, it's important to point out, we're in this transition. We're in this transition to deal with climate change, as I mentioned earlier, the transition to um, uh, cleaner resources. In a lot of cases, that's intermittent resources, whether it be solar or wind. And, and I, I want to make the point that, that that's not, that's not a threat just because we're going to be relying on more on, on intermittent resources.
but they do provide different challenges. They operate differently. So for instance, when the wind stops blowing for a time or a cloud comes over a solar farm, you got to have other facilities that ramp up. You got to have more flexibility on the grid, more uh, the ability of other power plants to ramp up or ramp down on a quick basis. Those, those are the challenges. They're not, they're not, they're certainly not something you can't overcome. You definitely can overcome them, but you just have to plan for that. But what you're seeing around the country in this debate over the reliability of the grid is that, you know, people, uh, uh, my former colleague, uh, Cheryl Flores from New England, um, used to say, you know, it's kind of like a Rorschach test. You see in it what, what you want. And I think that's the case here. We, we, after what happened in winter storm year, the first thing you heard of was, oh my God, the, 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 the wind farms brought down the grid. Well, if you really look at the facts and we did an analysis of this, um, uh, wind farms did have their issues. Some of the blades froze. The, the biggest problem by far was the lack of access, the natural gas plants that went down for a variety of different reasons. They need, these plants need to be winterized, for instance. Um, uh, and again, you see issues in, in, in other parts of the country. And the first thing people blame is this growth, this movement towards clean energy, renewable energy in particular. And I see it among some of my colleagues. They say, you know, we, we, just have, we have misguided state policies. We have, um, oh, the, the weather's not an issue. I mean, I have one of my colleagues says, literally says the weather's not an issue. It's the same colleague who also says we have misguided state policies. And I'm not here to really attack him personally, but, but the point is, is that that's the debate, the debate that's underway in this country. And it's very important, I think, that we, we, we make sure we keep the lights on from a reliability perspective. It's also important that we figure out what the, the real facts are. And, 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 and our job at FERC is not to pick resources. We don't say you should have more coal, you should have more wind. You should have, that, that's for the states to decide. That's written into law, actually. But it's, it's for us to say, this is the playing field that we're given. And how are we going to make sure that, that, that the grid operates reliably? And so we spent a lot of time thinking about that. Obviously, the weather, you can't change the weather. Um, and uh, although people have tried rain dances and so on in the past, but for the most part, you can't really change the weather. But at the same time, you have to, you have to figure out how do you deal with, how, you, how do you deal with this extreme weather? How do you make sure that utilities are properly uh, taking into account the fact is that we're in a situation, uh, that we're in a climate change situation and so on. And, and I, 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 I don't want to, I, I think this is going to be like the energy issue of the future in many ways grid reliability, and I think it already is in, in some respects. And again, people blaming various resources. And I say to the, uh, when I spoke to the uh, some clean energy advocates the other day, saying the same thing, you have to make sure that you get it right, that you, because otherwise people are gonna blame you. And so I, I, I think for every, everyone's focused focus on that, that a great deal. Um, and so I, I just wanted to highlight those three. I can, I can talk for more about a whole bunch of other issues. I, I won't even further bore you beyond what I've done so far on, on those issues. But I will say that we're gonna see, because of climate change, because of the impact on reliability, because of the impact on the way we regulate and, 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 and because of what's really at stake, what's really at stake, this transition that's underway is enormous, but there's a lot of money to be at stake, obviously. Uh, people that are invested in older, um, less efficient maybe, or, or power plants that, that, that are kind of being phased out. Obviously there are there is a lot of money at stake for those to be gained, those investing in the clean energy community and so on. And because of that, a lot of the issues, as I mentioned earlier, they're, they're much more higher, higher profile at FERC, the issues that, 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 that when people come to us, and, and, and again, we're not the, the sleepy, sleepy little agency that we, uh, that we, we once probably enjoyed that. that uh, but you're, you're seeing not only people pay more attention and, and give you examples, um, the Wall Street Journal, the editorial page clearly doesn't like me, but that's okay. I don't, I don't mind it. I consider it a badge of honor. But I mean, I never thought when I went to FERC that I'd have my picture show up on the Wall Street Journal editorial page. And my son was 13. I don't know how some, he somehow sees these things on, I won't even tell you the, 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 the news sources, but he, they, they write pretty nasty things, right? And so, but it's like, I, why would people ever pay attention to FERC? Why would, why would the Wall Street Journal really care about what we're doing? But there, there's, a, there's a, certainly a kind of a, a pushback, so to speak, on, on, in terms of what's going on in climate change. And I think that's, that's a big part of it. Um, and then you see it in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the participation at FERC in our proceedings and even more so in the litigation associated with our orders. There's always, for many years, people always, it's kind of a good profession to be in the energy bar is to sue FERC or to, to take FERC to court, uh, challenge challenge various orders. But you see it a lot more now, and not only in terms of number, but also in terms of the vigorousness, so that's probably not a good word, but vigor, the, the vigorousness of, of the, the arguments that are being made and the challenges that are being brought up to the courts. And, you know, you even see it, like I said before, members of Congress and pay, paying much more attention than the past. Um, from my situation, I'll just briefly talk about my situation. My term, FERC terms are five years. 
and my term ex actually expires, or actually technically expired on June 30th, but we're allowed to stay until Congress adjourns at the end of the year. President Biden did nominate me for a second term, and I've, I've enjoyed it. I, the, the issues have been fascinating and all that. And um, I, I gladly accepted when he, when he nominated me, but I have to be confirmed by the Senate. And um, uh, Chairman Manchin from West Virginia, who's chairman of the Senate Energy Committee, uh, recently announced that he wasn't quote unquote comfortable um, moving my nomination forward. Now, uh, we'll see what happens. There's still discussions going on about going forward. But I, but I think, again, this is a good example, not necessarily from, from me, me personally, but really more of a good example of how members of Congress are much, are much more focused on FERC. And I can tell you, because I used to work in the Senate Energy Committee on two different times, um, FERC nominees went through, no one even really paid much attention. Uh, now it's, it's not just me. Again, there was a Republican nominee a couple of years ago um, who, who, who passed through on a party line vote. The Republicans were majority at the time. Democrats are the majority, but um, very slim majority. So I need the full all 50 Democrats in order to get confirmed, and, and you know we'll see we'll see where that goes. But again, the point is it's just it's just something. Uh, it just it just it, it's a good example of, of of how FERC has become much more um, both politicized and also just more again less sleepy than, than before. Um, again, I think about the last five years, and again I mentioned I really really enjoyed it. I I I I I think about also in terms of the kind of the times that we live in, in the sense I mentioned before about for being more politicized and so on, in a sense from, from an outward perspective. Uh, but also some of our debates have probably been more vigorous, more nasty, if that's a good, a good word, uh, than, than in the past, more personal in some ways than in the past, where I mentioned earlier, for, there used to be a lot of comedy at FERC, I think because of what's at stake, but also because of, I think, just the, the nature of Washington, D.C. and what's changed just over the last, um, the last five, six, seven years, just the nature of the debate and the divisiveness that's going on around the country, that shows up. In, in, in the political discourse, including sleepy little regulatory uh, independent agencies. So um, I'm hoping that that isn't always the case, but I do, I, I don't, um, I don't, I suspect that, 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 it, that it will be for a while, again, given what's at stake and given, again, the, the significance uh, role that, 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 that FERC and other uh, government agencies are playing in this energy transition that's underway. So with that, um, I, again, I want to thank you for, for inviting me, but I'd love to answer any of your any of your questions and share anything that I can talk about. I can't talk about pending cases, but I can talk about anything else. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll do uh, a QA and a until 1.15. Uh, and as host, I'll uh, abuse the prerogative and ask the first question. Uh, and then it's about how we modernize uh, electricity markets and, and how you think about the kind of institutional political constraints within your existing authorities and what you can do. So let me let me identify three issues that have come up in recent years uh, and about how you, when you think about what FERC can do, how you tackle these kinds of issues. Um, so first you mentioned uh, in your remarks, PJM. Earlier this year, PJM said, we're getting so many applications for solar projects in our interconnect queue. So new solar projects who want to connect to the transmission system they said, we need to do a pause. We can't handle these. The, the number of applications they've received have increased dramatically because they used to be set up to manage applications from four or 500 megawatt gas plants or gigawatt sized nuclear plants. And now they're getting 20 megawatt, 30 megawatt solar facilities. So we see where with the, the, the new smaller generating uh, facilities, a lot more uh, of, of, of claims on the time and resources of the RTOs and ISOs and, and wondering how do we manage that in a new world where we think we're going to see more and more of that smaller, more decentralized uh, generating capacity. The second is the challenge of designing markets when the price clearing seems to be often zero or even negative. Uh, the so-called sort of duck curve we see in sort of generation as a function of renewables. How do we think about creating markets that function well when often the price uh, is not really sending, if you will, clear signals. And the third is, uh, how do we think about the role of carbon pricing in these markets and whether or not in wholesale markets, we could see something like as what New York State has talked about, about having a carbon price adder. Where do we see, how do you think about this both within your existing authorities, but recognizing as independent as you are, there's courts that may place constraints on you. There's members of Congress who place political constraints, or at least they use a loud volume when they call you on the phone. How do you think about some of these challenges when you're trying to push for more modernized power markets in the US? 
Uh, thanks for the all three questions. I, if I could take them in the order that you asked them. What, uh, first, with regard to um, generator connection, I, I want to make a clear. I can't talk about the PJM proposal because that's pending before us. Um, but I will talk in general about it. So, when you when you adding a when you add a new generating facility, and this, uh, many of you know this already, but just in case some don't, you have to you essentially get in line. There's a queue, and you have to have the 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 the, the utility to connect you to the grid has to do all these studies to make sure that that they they connect you to the grid. Is not going to be reliability issues, all sorts of engineering issues that are way beyond my understanding, but they're very important to, to, for, for those issues to be to be dealt with and figured out. And uh, that's it's always been the case when you add new generation. I think that the issue is, is that, as you mentioned, um, you have a lot more new generation that's ever been added before, in large part because instead of building like a 1,000 megawatt coal plant or nuclear plant, you're building like you know a lot of 100 megawatt, 150, 200 megawatt projects, uh, renewable projects. And if you look at the the, the, this, what they call the interconnection queue around the country, 90% of all the facilities in the interconnection queue across the country, we're talking about thousands of them, are wind, solar, or some combination of wind or solar and storage. So that's we, we, we kind of know where the future is going on that, but it also it's, 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 it's a big backlog. And so at FERC, we've, we, we put together a proposed rulemaking that we're, it's pending right now. Um, that would uh, attempt that attempts to speed up or expedite the process because it takes forever. There's all sorts of issues about um, uh, how you analyze, how quickly you analyze the request to connect to the grid, what it means when you when one uh, project drops out. If you if you if you look at the bunch of different projects, all of a sudden one drops out. How does that change the the, the kind of the engineering calculus associated with connected to the grid? And then when when so a lot of times when you when you connect a generator to the grid, you have to um, uh, sometimes you have to build extra generation facilities, and who who gets to pay for that? Who has to pay for that? I should say, not gets to. Um, uh, those are all issues that we that we try to we're, we're trying to wade through at FERC right now. With the goal, if, if we don't start expediting this process, a lot of these projects are going to die. Uh, they're just never going to get built. And 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 to the extent you need to replenish retiring generation facilities with this new generation, you're going to have more reliability problems on a going forward basis. So. We're trying to deal with it, but again, I can't talk about the PJM proposal. The second being about uh, zero marginal cost pricing. So, when people and I'm not, I, I, I guess it's a major in economics, but I don't, I don't, I'm not an economist at all. But um, when you, uh, you know, a lot of uh, generation when you bid into these auctions, you bid in at your marginal cost. And um, in, in the old traditional facilities, that's a lot of your marginal cost is your fuel, coal, gas, so on, nuclear too, in some ways. Um, but for wind and solar, there's the, the fuel is pretty much free, right? So it's 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 the capital cost. So you're bidding in a lot of times you've been in at zero, and the more uh, more intermittent wind and solar that you have on the grid, the more uh, the, these auctions uh, keep on buying up essentially or, or taking up the zero marginal cost generation, and that brings down the price of, of generation. It's not a good way of really setting a good market clearing market, market clearing price. And so people have been trying to uh, address that for a number of number of times, a number, a number of years now. Um, you mentioned California is a good example. There are certain, like for those of you that don't know the duck curve in, in, in California, but this is also now showing up in other Western states as well. Um, during the day, there's so much solar. I mean, the solar is driving the price well below zero. And um, there's there's way too much solar. Then there's not just not enough demand on the grid for that solar. And then all of a sudden at five o'clock, let's say during the winter, the sun starts going down solar comes off the grid and you don't have enough other generation to make up for it. Sometimes the prices just shoot up like crazy. That's not a good way to really run a market. It creates all sorts of inefficiencies. I think as energy storage and battery storage becomes more, um, some, some, some developments, um, some, some, I guess, uh, there are more improvements made on battery storage in particular. I know there are like people uh, at the labs and so on are looking at different types of battery storage because battery storage is somewhat limited now because essentially you run these lithium ion batteries four hours at a time. Um, to the extent you can have longer longer term battery, battery storage, I think that'll even things out a little bit. All that solar will then go towards um, uh, 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 storage and so on. But I think that's really at the long, the wrong one. The answer the short term is we're looking at all sorts of issues that are that are showing up in our markets. I mentioned the need for more flexibility and how do we how do we actually value that? How do we actually compensate for, for that flexible generation? We're not doing a good job of that right now. So I think my guess is you're gonna see a lot of these regions reconsidering a lot of the ways they um, they currently, the markets are currently structured. Uh, and then uh, I'm trying to remember the last question. Carbon price. Car carbon price. Yeah, so uh, 
a couple of years ago, um, uh, FERC uh, issued a policy statement, which is essentially some sort of guidance saying that if anyone came to us with a carbon pricing uh, mechanism, especially if a state came to us with something they had adopted, a carbon pricing mechanism, we would, we would try to facilitate that carbon pricing into the, into the wholesale market, try to take that into account. Um, no one's taken us up on that offer. And, and, and you mentioned New York, and New York's been talking about it for a number of years now. And as I understand it, they haven't really they haven't moved any 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 closer to actually adopting a carbon price on electricity. Um, but I think you know it's it's probably from an economic perspective the most efficient way to go. But it's uh, it, you know, given our political situation, it's, it's no states going forward with that. Everyone's uh, I, I think I, I'm not sure that you're going to see a lot of states moving forward. But from a FERC perspective, I think I'm not entirely sure. And I'll just say this for my own. This is my own opinion. My colleagues might not agree. I don't think we have the authority under the statutory authority we have currently. To actually impose carbon pricing, but again, we can facilitate that if states have already adopted adopted it on their own. But um, nothing—I don't think there's anything on the horizon. Do you want to go back around the line? Sure. sure. Oh, do you want? To... <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Carlos, I'm on leave from the World Bank, but I did not speak for the bank in any way, shape, or form, and so forth. Um, Advice and lessons learned on the financial side, particularly on stranded assets. You mentioned a little bit um, the authority that you know no carbon pricing, but you know a lot of these coal power plants. I was wondering if you had any uh, uh, advice on that. You mentioned a little bit about flexible uh, uh, generation and on-grid storage, behind the meter storage. If you had anything on that or subsidy reform, which you talked to touch a little bit love to hear anything you might have because this whole business of the greening the financial sector basically is greening the financial <laughs> thank you sure. so with regard to the with regard to um stranded costs and so on I, you know there, there was FERC uh a number of years back FERC issued and uh, several orders aimed at uh facilitating uh, competition facilitating open transmission access and facilitating competition and there was provision included in that order that that authorized uh, and enabled uh, utilities to come to the commission and seek uh, compensation for assets they, didn't, they, they had uh, invested in that were no longer economic because of this change in policy um that's obviously been a long time ago and i don't you don't i don't I haven't seen maybe I, I see people talk about it every so often but not a lot of uh, activity associated with stranded cost recovery and a lot of, i see that really is occurring more at the state level when states adopt these various policies promoting Green energy. How do we? How do they take into account um, utility investments made over over the years under a different regulatory compact? Um, with regard to uh, uh, the the the, well, the, the, the state, I said state subsidies reform, I don't. Again, I think we talked about the markets. I don't think that's really. I think that's uh, that's gone by the wayside. I think people realize that that's really up for the states to decide and not for uh, the markets to take into account differences uh, associated with with state subsidies. Um, I, I, I'm trying to remember what, what you would. Um, and you did just left. You mentioned it's not allowed for fixed resources, but on grid storage. Yes. Yes. Storage, so, yeah. So, so you're, you're exactly right. So, we're not allowed to pick, we don't pick winners and losers, as we say. We don't pick resources. But our job is to, under the federal power, is to, is to prevent undue, what they call undue discrimination. And so, we've issued a number of orders over the years, whether it be for intermittent generation, whether it be for storage. I mentioned storage, whether it be behind the meter resources called distributed energy resources, um, essentially uh, uh, telling, telling or ordering the RTOs around the country, the regional transmission organizations around the country, to essentially remove whatever, whatever barriers that might exist in their markets. I mentioned earlier how some of these market rules were created when a lot of these technologies were really people didn't really think about them. So um, we're in the process now of, of implementing some of those orders. It, take, it takes a long time, unfortunately. But um, from a future perspective, at least from, a, we, we only have the authority of the wholesale, but I think that will provide another revenue stream for those technologies, their ability to sell into the wholesale market. So that includes demand response. I want to take a quick point. Demand response is essentially when uh, big energy consumers, even small energy consumers say, okay, I'm going to essentially sell my consumption back to the grid during times of high demand. California is a good example. They use it a lot when, when it's really hot, when the demand for energy is very high. And um, we, we essentially have gotten, FERC over the years have gotten rid of most of the barriers that exist for demand response to participate in the wholesale market around to sell you essentially sell your you know, it's like a factory can decide well we'll shut down like on these days if you pay us thank you sure hi i'm uh, charles senior undergrad 
Um, we've seen how hard it is to build projects in the US. I think the New England Clean Energy Connect project is, is an interesting example of that. There's both the more irrational sort of nimbyism concerns, but also some of the more, uh, you know, difficult environmental justice and equity considerations. So I'm curious, in your view, how policymakers and regulators can more proactively incorporate some of those concerns into the clean energy planning process rather than sort of taking a more, more reactive approach? Sure, I, I, if I can answer those really, two, I think there are two parts to that question. I wanna start by saying, I really do, do think that we have, a, in this country, we do have an infrastructure issue in the sense, um, not only funding for infrastructure, but really it just it t t takes far too long. It's complex. Uh, agencies like FERC, but all, all sorts of, you have to go through a whole bunch of different agencies, state and federal sometimes. And uh, it, it leads uh, in many cases to needed infrastructure not being built. Some people say, well, to hell with it. We're just not gonna do this. And as I mentioned earlier, we, we, we have climate change issues, we need more clean energy. People sometimes say, well, I don't want a wind farm in my backyard. I understand that, but that's, you know, at some point it, it, it gets, or I don't want a transmission line traversing my state. And I don't wanna talk about the main issue because that may come before us, but in general, that's become a big issue around the country. So we need to figure something out from a permitting perspective about facilitating uh, facilitating the, the decision-making at least to be a little more efficient, a little more speedy. Um, on the other hand, you're exactly right. And this is an issue that, with regard to environmental justice and equity. Um, this is a big issue that we are just starting to tackle at FERC in the sense that we are supposed to consider when we site a, a, a hydro facility or we site a, a pipeline or an LNG facility, we're supposed to consider the impacts of our decisions on environmental justice communities. And that's a longstanding uh, policy to do that. And, and the courts have said we, we are, we're essentially required to do so under NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, but quite frankly, very few agencies have, have done, traditionally done a good job of that. And we certainly haven't, um, I'll be honest. I, I think some of our, when I first got to the commission, I was reading some of our environmental impact statements. And I thought it was like, it was, I mean, <laughs> They gave maybe one sentence to the issue, and that you can tell they didn't really care. I mean, people who wrote, I, when I said they, some of the people that wrote the environmental impact statements, I, I thought we didn't really do, do a good job. So we actually appointed a senior counsel for environmental justice and equity, um, but we've been struggling trying to figure out how do you adequately take into account. First of all, you have to figure out uh, which environmental justice communities are being impacted by our decisions. And then once you do that, you have to decide what you're going to do, how you're going to mitigate the impacts of those communities. Where you are you going to reject a project because it has too many impacts? And I recently went down to um, Port Arthur, Texas, in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Met with I mean I, I just when you get when you see up front uh, and up close all these facilities out there and you see all the how dirty the air is and you talk to all these. I was talking to one guy the other day from Freeport, Texas. I mean he's had like 40 family members die of cancer. All in this area. I mean they, they call it Cancer Alley for a reason, right? And so you have to take those issues into account. How do you balance that against what we're supposed to do? The, the issues were the, the 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 standards we're supposed to consider. When we're supposed to cite a particular project, and we're struggling with that. I think I think the, to, to I want to commend the Biden administration as a whole because they're I think for the first time they're actually taking these issues seriously. Um, but th there aren't any easy solutions. So people are trying to right now we're struggling with it. And everyone else is struggling with it. How do you how do you balance those issues? Uh, and, I, and I have to say that's been a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And every time. I consider one of these pipeline cases, one of these LNG facilities, quite frankly, I think about my recent trip to Port Arthur and Lake Charles and think about all those people there. And I, I just, we, we owe them at least due consideration and, and also making sure that their voices are heard. For a long time, their voices weren't heard. And so we're, we're focusing on that too. We have a new office of public participation to try to bring people in that don't normally participate in our proceedings, facilitate their participation, make sure they comment on the record, but even more so that they just get their thoughts across. Um, and I think that's at least the start, but it's not satisfying at this point. Hi, my name is Andrew. I'm an undergrad. Um, thank you for your talk. I was curious about if FERC has a vision for expectations for regulations of hydrogen markets and pipelines in the future and in what ways that might be informed by precedent for natural gas. That's a great question. And uh, so we, we, we get asked this question quite a lot, both from people on Capitol Hill, but also people in the industry that are thinking about moving into the hydrogen business. And there's a lot of excitement about hydrogen. And there's still some issues that have to be overcome, both technical and cost issues, but I think uh, yeah, hopefully eventually they will be. But uh, people are wondering how, what's the best way to transport all this hydrogen that if you, when, it, when it's uh, produced. And I think people are thinking it's gonna be primarily by pipeline. Uh, right now, we're uh, not entirely clear. We don't, we don't think that we actually have authority to site hydrogen 
uh, pipelines or to um, regulate the transportation of hydrogen pursuant to pipeline like we do for natural gas. But uh, in the permitting bill that uh, Senator Manchin uh, put forth that, that um, uh, I, I, you know, I guess at the beginning of the fall, um, uh, the, that permitting bill had a provision in there that clarified that FERC would have had that authority. Obviously it didn't pass. I suspect at some point Congress will, will enact that clarification. Hi, um, my name is Tristan. I'm a researcher at MIT. Uh, just a quick question. I, I agree that um, it's not your role to promote any particular technology, um, but we've seen, so I'll take a quick example, um, like hydropower, for example, has worked very well for certain countries. I think Panama has 100% of its energy coming from hydro. Uh, Quebec, which is not too far, has 90% of its energy coming from hydro. Um, where do you see, like, how do you think um, you guys can work with different state actors to, to try to not promote, but make sure the right technologies are supported? Thanks. So we, um, when we uh, license, a, or, or there's a proposal to license a hydropower project that's pending before us, we're supposed to determine again whether that project's in the public interest. I, you know, my personal view is that you should take into account if there are environmental benefits associated with the project, we should take that into account. Um, and there are, uh, you know, obviously zero emissions. There are also, um, the reason that hydropower has been um, somewhat limited in the past is, 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 is uh, some of the, there are a lot of other environmental issues that have to be addressed in the licensing process. And a lot of times these hydro projects, many of them receive their original licenses. And these licenses sometimes last 30, 40, 50 years. They receive their original licenses when uh, environmental issues were not um, uh, significantly addressed at the time, just because different laws and so on. And um, now they're all of a sudden, they're coming up for relicensing. And others, they're saying, well, we got a problem here. We're going to have to do make a significant additional investments to address some fish issues and so on. And um, we, we're seeing not a lot, but we actually the other day approved uh, the, uh, uh, the decommissioning, essentially the removal of uh, four dams, uh, what's called the Lower Klamath, which is uh, Oregon, California border. Uh, and because that very recently, the utility came in and says, we can't afford anymore to um, uh, to, 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 to deal with, the, with what we know are going to be more stringent licensing conditions on a going forward basis. So they entered some deal with other affected um, stakeholders and, and they're moving forward with the decommissioning strategy. Having said that, there are still a lot of uh, un, essentially dams that haven't been, um, uh, haven't been uh, electrified yet, haven't, haven't, but there, there could be generation added. And I think there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of interest in that. I think there's, and we have all processes to try to expedite the, the permitting process associated with that. But so far, it's it's been it's been a little slow. We haven't seen a lot of uh, companies come forward and say we we really we, we want to use your your expedited licensing process uh, to move forward. But um, you're right, it's zero emissions. It's a very important part of our resource mix in the United States. Uh, some parts of the country, the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, for example, have a ton of hydro. But even then, there's a big debate going on right now as to whether some of those dams should be removed uh, to deal with salmon issues. So. Uh, there's no, even when, so there's no perfect generation mix. They all have their impacts. I mentioned earlier about permitting. We have to figure out a proper balancing here on a going forward basis. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, thank you very much for the discussion. Um, I had two questions um, based on the case studies that you presented earlier. Uh, so the first one is about uh, considering greenhouse gas emissions. Um, how do you quantify the impact of greenhouse gas when you assess, say, an LNG plant? Um, and how would you ideally quantify it where there are no pushback? And my second question is regarding uh, power lines. Uh, for example, in California, there's um, a number of examples of power lines causing wildfires. Uh, does FERC have any authority to, um, you know, regulate how power lines should um, interact with, say, uh, fires and, and the woods in general. Thank you. So with regard to the first question, with regard to uh, how do you quantify or assess whether emissions are significant, that's that's a very, it's an excellent question that one we struggle with. There's something I think people are probably aware of known as the social cost of carbon, which I think was uh, utilized somewhat, or at least uh, the, C, the Council on Environmental Quality during the Obama administration put forth um, some uh, concepts about how you, how you can, can essentially put a dollar value on, on emissions, for instance, the impact that uh, emissions are going to have on climate change and what that impact will be on the economy and so on. There's all, a lot of variables going to discount rates and, and assumptions and so on. But I, in my, my, my view, it would, be, it would be very helpful to have that, that method, some, some sort of methodology to quantify. But you don't have to do that. And, and that's one thing we debate a lot at FERC 
if we actually, I have said, if, even if you don't want to use the social cost of carbon because you don't like it, you think it's too generous or something like that. Uh, you know, and I, I got criticized for this, but I said, it's kind of like the eyeball test, right? You, we, we do that when, when we, when wetlands, I use wetlands as an example a lot, because we, 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 when we consider these pipelines that are developed or LNG facilities, a lot of times there's wetlands lost there. And we never say, well, 30 is too much and 45, 40, 30 acres is too little, 45 acres is too much, right? We don't say that. We just, every commissioner on their own just looks at the numbers and say, we think this is significant. This is where it's located and we don't. And we could do that on climate change. I think, and, and we do, we, we could do it, on, we do it on other issues all the time. So that's one way of, of, of considering it. But if I had my druthers, I would, I, I would prefer to have some sort of uh, easier methodology such as the, the social cost uh, of, of, of carbon. Um, with regard, I, 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 I'm sorry, like I'm exhausted today, so I, I forgot your second question already. My apologies. Power lines, yes. So um, yeah, so so a lot of the, the issues in California, it's not just California anymore. You're starting to see this in other states in the West as well. Great concerns that when it gets windy, bring a power line down, starts a fire. Um, and California is a very interesting liability provision that imposes full liability on utilities to the extent that 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 that, that was the that was the cause of a major fire. And obviously, it's utilities that that's, it, it threatens their, their their economic health to have that potential liability. So what they, they, they a lot of those lines that fall, they're not all. But a lot of those lines that come down are more distribution lines that FERC doesn't have authority over. We really have authority over, like I said, the bulk power system, the major, the big high voltage lines out there. Um, so uh, again, the states, the states, in, in many cases now are telling the utilities to take uh, preemptive action. That if you know it's going to be windy extremely windy at a certain time, you think there's some danger of the line coming down, you shut off people for four or five hours, whatever it is, until the, the wind subsides. And, 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 that, and it's not, it, it, it obviously is, it, it, it's not great. No one, no one likes having their power shut off, but it can, considering the alternative, it's a much better approach. And they, they continue to do that. They, I think their science is getting much better as to when they figure out when there's a real danger or not. And they can really limit the areas of, of, of shutting off power. Um, but we do have authority again, as I mentioned earlier about reliability, and we do have what we call vegetation management standards, uh, reliability standards imposed on utilities with these big power lines that they have to make sure that you know that, that they every so often cut down the trees, the, the, the shrubbery, whatever it is that might endanger uh, that a wire might come in contact with and cause cause a fire. Um, just yesterday, where I live just outside of Washington D.C. There's a plane, actually a small plane, that that hit a big Pepco, like big high voltage transmission uh, line. And it got stuck up there. Fortunately, the two people were uh, took them about ten hours, but they got them out. But it caused massive blackouts. Um, uh, so it's it, 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 these lines are obviously very they're, they're very important to to do what you can. But sometimes those accidents will happen. But at least on vegetation management, we do require them to as much as possible limit um, uh, their their contact with other uh, something else that might cause a fire. Awesome, Chairman, thank you so much for being here. I really liked your description of the grid outages as the Warshock test, because I think you do see a lot of different reasons for those. One of the big ones is around the idea of a disorderly transition. And so renewable assets are being put on the grid without a more systems approach of understanding that. Do you see as we start to look forward that that will continue or intensify and make the intermittency and the reliability issue more complex? Or do things like the IRA and the infrastructure bill start to like center that around a more orderly transition? Like what are we looking for in five or 10 years? Kind of so I think it's a timing issue in a lot of respects. You, you, and you see New, New England's probably a great example where you know, you're seeing some older generation retire and people were, have been talking about offshore wind and bring, obviously bringing in the hydropower from Canada as was mentioned earlier, but also the offshore wind is gonna play a big role. We're seeing the timing on those offshore wind facilities slow down for a variety of different reasons. And so um, uh, there is a concern that, that are, we, are we shutting down facilities more quickly than, than, than maybe they should be shut down, and, and given the fact that their, their replacements aren't up and running yet. A lot of regions, not all of them, have what they call reliability must run, or they, they call it different things in different regions, but essentially reliability must run policies, essentially, where you have to get approval. If you're going to planning on shutting down a big power plant, you have to get approval from the grid operator. And in many cases, um, if the grid operator thinks, well, you, 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 you need to wait two years in order to keep the lights on, essentially they pay, they, they enter into an agreement with the power plant to pay that power plant. Uh, essentially, it's cost plus a, a good rate of return or something like that to keep them running until they're no longer needed. Uh, not every region has that. A lot of them do. But um, I think that, that's the kind of approach that, I, that, in my opinion, is very valuable to make sure that the transition doesn't become too disorderly. Great. So uh, please join me in thanking Chairman Rich Click for his presentation today. Thank you, Rich. That's great. <laughs>
ありがとうございます。